Oh, hello there. How we doing? Welcome to the ETF show, which is maybe called what the ETF in the future. I haven't actually changed anything yet, but it's a good idea. Um, Spencer Israel, you know me from pre-market prep and uh, half of Benzinga's shows, <laughs> quite frankly. And um, I'll be with you for the next hour talking ETFs, right? The coolest part of the market. Forget stonks. Forget stonks. We don't care about stonks. We care about baskets of stonks, right? ETFs. That's what we're about here on the ETF show. Just to recap, as I always do, what is the purpose of this show? Why do we like ETFs so much? Number one, they're diversified, right? Baskets of any asset, not just stocks. Baskets of bonds, commodities, any asset you could think of, real estate. Number two, they're tax efficient. Every time someone sells in a mutual fund or any time a mutual fund manager uh, sells a security or an asset, that's a taxable event that gets passed down to you, the owners of the fund. That's not the case with the ETFs. There are no such taxable events because they trade on exchanges just like stocks. They're more tax efficient than, than mutual funds. They have low fees. Uh, mutual funds will have load fees, management fees. You don't really get that with most ETFs. You get the expense ratio. There are some. There are fees. They're not free, but they are cheaper on the fee front than mutual funds. Number four, actively traded. There is liquidity usually, right? You want to you want to buy or sell a fund right now? Go for it. You want to do it at the at the open at at, at noon at three at whenever? Go for it. Mutual funds trade at one price. You get one price for that day. Everybody gets that same price. Mutual funds or ETFs, not so much. Of course, the other side of that is there's the bid ask spread you got to contend with. But for most people, it's not really a big thing. They're more liquid throughout the day and they're transparent. You can see always what your fund is holding. They, uh, in the case, people like Kathy Wood, who actively manage their funds, will post their trades daily as opposed to mutual funds, which may only rebalance uh, quarterly and, and post their holdings uh, sparingly. So they're more transparent than mutual funds. Those are our five reasons why we love ETFs, why we do this show. Here's the schedule for today. We're going to go through the uh, gainers and losers of the week in terms of returns, in terms of flows. I want to show you the tools that some of the tools that I use for my ETF research, I want to walk through a little bit. Uh, there was a very interesting filing last week, and a few people reached out to me about the this FOMO ETF. It is not it is not out. It's not live, but there was a filing, and I want to walk through that filing a little bit with you. And then we have our guest, Frank Holmes, CEO and CIO of U.S. Global Investors, and. Um, He's got the Jets ETF. You all know that one by now, right? J-E-T-S. Jets, Jets, Jets. Also, he's got the Go Gold ETF. Ticker G-O-A-U. We're going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about airlines, talk about gold. It's been a very interesting year on the airlines front. And Frank has a lot of thoughts. So then after that, we will do some questions from the chat. So we got a full show planned for today. I will do my absolute best to keep up with the chat throughout the day or throughout the hour and uh, answer your questions as they come up. Let's just start with this. Let's just start with some questions right now. Uh, would, it, would I buy Boeing right now? That's not a question for me. That's a question for Frank. Let me ask Frank. Would he buy? I'm sure uh, Boeing is in the Jets ETF. In fact, I know it is. Uh, let's ask him about Boeing right now. What else? Greg Martin says he trades them. Okay, great. You can trade ETFs. That's that's one. That's you can't really trade mutual funds. Um, that is, that's why ETFs exist, right? To provide the flexibility. Plural use wants to know more about the TGIF ETF. Okay, we will look at that later in the show. Writing all this down. Hello from New Jersey. Where in New Jersey are you from? Risking ideas because we all know New Jersey is the greatest state in the world. Um, what else? UFO. We're, we're going to have uh, Andrew Chadden, who is the manager of, of UFO, on this show next week. So 
hold any UFO thoughts, Greg Martin. We'll ask Andrew. Well, maybe don't hold them. Ask them, and then I'll ask Andrew your questions next week's uh, on next week's show. Okay, let's just get to what happened last week. All right, shall we? Let's move on to some winners and losers. So, for the past few shows, I've been showing you um, uh, screeners that exclude leveraged and inverse funds because it's kind of like cheating, right? When we talk about returns and leverage, leverage is like steroids for returns. But I want to show that I want to do two separate screens. One for the all the ETFs uh, and their returns of the last week, you, including leverage funds, and one that does not. So let's just start with, with the leverage here. Um, you can see last week, best performing ETFs. Look, no real surprise, right? They all use leverage. Let me zoom out. All right. RETL, right? Directions Retail Bullish, um, bullish Fund. Uh, leveraged Aerospace and Defense. Bullish Small Cap. Okay. Bullish Russell 2000. Bullish consumer discretionary, bullish banks, right? Bullish Mexico. That's interesting. Um, no real surprise to see all these funds at the uh, the top of your uh, returns uh, leaderboard because they they're juiced with leverage. Um, this can tell you though some idea of where traders um, are uh, flocking to or where they are uh, bearish, right? Because remember, you, you can use these as a hedge. So maybe, for all we know, a lot of people are super bearish retail and they're just using the RETL as a hedge, right? We don't we don't know. That's the thing about uh, that is data. It doesn't really tell us which side of the market uh, these people are on. Um, but there could be there could be a lot of buyers of this only because these same buyers are short all the stuff in this basket. We don't really know. Anyway, uh, what about non-leveraged results? Let's take a look. Look, reversal again, right? We've talked about this on our show on Pre Market Prep last last week or so. Last week was a hard reversal away from value, away from the 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 you know the traditional the energy ETFs. Remember two weeks ago it was all energy. ET uh, on this list? Not now. Look at this. Cannabis, cannabis, retail, moonshot, um, clean energy, video games. A lot of cannabis on here. Clean, more, a lot of clean energy on here too. Uh, so rotation away from the value into the growth last week. This is ETFDB.com. Parth. I'm going to walk through a little bit. Uh, this is one of the tools that I use. I'm going to walk through the rest of them that, uh, that I use uh, later on the show. So uh, last week, best performers, growth, right? High flyers, Momo names, momentum names. If you go down to your biggest losers of the week, no real surprise. When the Momo is hot, the value is not. Okay. Natural gas. Energy. That's interesting. Look, treasury. Let's go keep going. The boring stuff, right? Oh, China. All right. China had a weak week. You can see that right clearly. China had a weak week. You can see a lot of Chinese ETFs there. Consumer staples. Okay. Bonds. A lot of boring stuff was down last week, right? You see that rotate that that relationship is clear as day. When one side of the market is hot, the other is not. What about flows? Let's look at flows. Uh, let's start here. They just go one week. Okay. Very interesting. A lot of money flowing into the Schwab US dividend ETF, SCHD. Is this the top of the list? No, this is the second page. What am I doing? That's more like it. I was going to say, that was a very small number <laughs> for the top no, number one uh, heaviest in inflow uh, ETF last week. Small cap. Q's energy CP again. This could mean that people are chasing, or it could mean that people are hedging. We don't really know. It could it could mean both, you know. But it but it's 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 notable because it, it tells you at least okay where is the money going. It doesn't matter why the money is going there necessarily. It just where's where's the money going? The money is going into these funds in the last week. Okay. You clearly see money flowing into value ETFs. So value, value, value. 
ARKK is up there. We talked about this, was it Friday? ARKK had uh, 1.2 billion of inflows last week, and the rest of the ARK funds all had massive, not not massive, that, that's, that's, not, that's not accurate, um, but outflows nonetheless, right? Look at that, ARKW had some outflows, ARKF outflows, ARKG outflows. That's not a ton. That's definitely not massive, $172 million of outflows. That's not a lot. But it's notable for sure. So ARKK diverging hardcore on the flows front from the rest of the ARK family. What about year to date? I have to keep one eye on this. Every every few weeks, I just like, like to check a longer term fund flow table, right? Let's see where the money is going year to date. XLF, very interesting, right? Finance, we talked about the banks. Let me pull up. Um, uh, I have this is from earlier with my segment with Luke. Let's get that off there. This is Benzinga Pro. What are you for charting? XLF. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's having a good year, right? Let's go back to our table. This was this was interesting. Uh, Eric Bautunis from Bloomberg, who uh, I've spoken to before, and we'll have him back on this show. This is a tweet from him from the twelfth. And there's a lot of numbers on the screen. I just want to point your attention to the top right. Okay. So that year to date column in the top right and the one week column, $26 billion of inflows into US ETFs last week. Uh, yeah, this is la- in the last week as of the 12th. And $184.5 billion of inflows to, into US ETFs this year. So forget about all these other numbers. I mean, they're interesting. But those two are, are the are the headline here, right? A lot of inflows into U.S. ETFs, and again, why why is this inter- notable, interesting? Because this number, especially on a macro level, can tell us where people are interested, especially when you get on the level of like U.S. versus emerging markets or asset classes like stocks versus bonds versus commodities, right? This kind of thing tells us where people have their eyes, who they're looking at. So this is a bullish, this is an unquestionably bullish sign. As Eric pointed out right there, that's four billion dollars of inflows per day. And the normal is one and a half billion. So, so the money is still the 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 faucet is still on, right? The money faucet is still on in terms of US equity ETFs. So very interesting. Actually, that's this is just all this is not equity, this is all ETFs. So you know, you go back to your year-to-date flows chart, and it's, I mean, it's all U.S., right? It's all U.S. stuff. And this this reflects what Eric's chart showed as well. The difference is that's on Bloomberg, and this is ETFDB.com, which is not free, but a little bit more affordable than Bloomberg. Um, so this is one of the tools that I use, ETFDB. Um, sorry, let me ca- let me catch up on the chat. Also, if y'all hear like a noise, like a beeping noise, please tell me if you can hear that because I feel like such a like a freaking boomer. I don't know what that noise is. Okay, then my computer's been making this weird noise for the last week, and I don't know where it's coming from. So if you hear that noise, tell me because I'm losing my damn mind. Um, okay. Let me catch up on the chat here. Is there a cupcake ETF? No, that's just a picture that, that my girlfriend drew, and I want to keep it up there to you know make her happy. Um, Greg Martin, yeah, this this screener here, this is the ETF universe, right? This is the ETF universe. Uh, let me see, catch up on the chat here. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, okay, cool. Let me show you now. That's pretty much it uh, as far as I want to what I want to cover for the. Uh, flows and returns the last week. Let's talk about some tools I use. Obviously, we've been on ETFDB.com um, for the last 15 minutes, but there are this, I, I pay for this. There are other tools that, that are free. This does have a free version. It's a lot less information, but you can use this uh, for free as well. Here's one that I use. ETFDB has the same tool, but I think it's behind a paywall. This is free. ETFchannel.com. Free promo for them, okay? Why do I use this? Very simple. Right there. ETF Finder. Ah, oh, 
I wonder what uh, what ETFs hold GameStop. Boom. There it is. Not just which ETFs hold it, but how much of GameStop, how much of the ETF is GameStop, okay? XRT. 16% of XRT is GameStop. This is every ETF that holds GameStop. So if in, in, in you know, tomorrow morning... There's like GameStop news or whatever. GameStop blasts off or GameStop crashes. I don't, I don't even know what it did today. That's what it, what it do today. It's uh okay. So it's down today. If if tomorrow morning GameStop goes up to three hundred, maybe don't pile in the door on GameStop like everyone else. Play the derivative game, right? Go look at XRT, XSVM, right? Ten percent of that is GameStop. PSCD. I don't know what these funds are. Doesn't matter. You know they hold GameStop, right? It's not about the direct play; it's about the indirect play. These all have to go up. Uh, if, you know, if GameStop's going to go up a hundred percent, then and it's ten percent of 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 a, of a basket, then yeah, that that basket's going up, right? So you got to figure it like that. So this this is a very good, very good tool. I like to use when I want to know which stocks. Um, or which ETFs hold a specific stock. So ETFchannel.com, I, I, I recommend this. Um, any good dividend ETFs? Well, I, I want to do a whole show about dividend ETFs because I have some opinions there, uh, but I don't have any. We, we can go through that later, but um, that's 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 a larger conversation as well. Here's one, ETF.com, okay? Again, this tool is also on ETFDB, but I'm pretty sure it's behind a paywall. ETF.com has a fund flow tool. Okay. So I don't like like this stuff like in the in in the table here. I don't know if you if this is behind a paywall or not, but I know for a fact that this is free. So ARKK. All I did was search for it. All I did was add a date range. And here it is. Inflows for the last week. Okay. And inflows by day. Now, this data may not necessarily be 100% accurate that is okay right again i'm i'm giving you i'm giving you free tools all right so so you may see a discrepancy if you're on etftb versus etf.com you may see a discrepancy um it happens okay um sorry <laughs> is 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 what I can say there. Okay, so ETFTB. If you want fund flows, you're curious. Uh, you know how much money has gone into um, SOXX, right? The the semiconductor ETF. And let's go year to date. Just out of curiosity. Boom, 130 billion dollars. Right there. There's a daily breakdown. That's it. Super simple. Super, super simple. Madden, you know what I mean, man. <laughs> and it's not going to be right 100% of the time, but honestly, most data is not, okay? Whether you're on a a Bloomberg or not, right? Market data is uh, is finicky, right? And the last thing I use is Benzinga Pro, right? And, and we're actually going to go more into that uh, in a second here. But let me make sure I... Yeah, those are the main three, ETFDB, ETF.com, and ETF channel. Okay, let's go to this um, other thing, this other news I saw last week, this FOMO ETF, all right? I had a few, a few people tweet at me about this. So Matt Tuttle, who is the guy behind the uh, one of the SPAC ETFs, he filed for two new ETFs. Filed for a FOMO ETF and the exact opposite, the fat tail risk ETF. And I thought we can go through this very briefly. There's not much to go through. Um, if you've never seen an SEC filing for an ETF, you're you're about to. I I use Benzinga Pro for this. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull my screen up here. You can go and find this filing on the SEC's website. Uh, like the SEC's database is called Edgar. You can go there. It is not user friendly at all, and kind of a pain in the ass. So I just use Benzinga Pro, for example. Okay, I don't know anything about this fund. All I know 
is it's one of them is called a FOMO, and he was filed last week. That's all I know. So I went to a news feed that's got SEC checked off. These are SEC filings and press releases. And I literally just search FOMO. And boom. There it is. Tuesday, March 9th. It literally was that easy. You can do this on Edgar. It will take you 10 steps. And you can do it. Or you can do it here and take you two steps, right? So anyway, back to... uh, what we're doing here. Okay. Collaborative investment series trust. This is a filing for these two ETFs. The purpose of this filing is to explain exactly what these funds are meant to do and their risks. Okay. Uh, most of this stuff is pretty boilerplate, right? I, I recommend reading one of these or at least skimming one. If you've never seen one before, uh, it can be pretty educational in terms of uh, like how they explain certain risks, but they're going to be pretty boilerplate. I want to call your attention first to the FOMO. For a second. I don't know if you can see that. It says management fee, your expense ratio, 0.8%. Not not crazy, right? Not crazy high. Not Certainly not low, but not crazy high. As far as an ETF is concerned, that, that's, that's fair. That's fair. Okay. Uh, no other fees. Of course, because it's an ETF. We don't do load fees. We don't do management fees, 12B1 fees. We don't do that stuff. Okay. Um, Let's talk about... So uh, there's. I I scrolled past it. I clicked on each of these summaries already. So let's just pull up a separate window. I know it's very small. Zoom in for you. Uh, Okay. I need to do one more. Um, now I lost my page because I had it all perfect. I had it all perfect, and I didn't realize how small it was. Oh darn it! Let me go back to my um. Uh, go back to my Benzinga Pro. All right, I had this whole thing worked out too. And uh, now I am all lost. Okay, so here we go. There's the expense ratio, as I said, 0.8%. Um, da, 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 da. Right there. The fund's name is an abbreviation for the fear of missing out. And the advisor intends to achieve the fund's investment objective by investing in securities that reflect current or emerging trends. The advisor's model evaluates market trends in various asset classes across different time frames, and they will engage in frequent trading, resulting in a high portfolio turnover rate. This is an actively managed fund, right? There is no index. There is no FOMO index, right? It's going to be going to be an active fund, tactical, as they say. And yeah, that's pretty much it, right? For for the, for the moment, right? That's kind of what you need, what you need to know, right? Here it outlines all the risks. Um, a lot of this is a boilerplate, right? Management risk, right? Large cap stock risk. Some is unique, like SPAC risk, right? Not every phone, not every ETF holds SPACs. Here's the the fat tail risk ETF. Exact same fee, right? 0.8 percent. This is basically the exact opposite of the FOMO ETF, right? The fund is actively managed and seeks to achieve its objective by investing in one, cash and U.S. bonds, government bonds, two ETFs that invest in gold-related derivatives, U.S. equity securities and U.S. treasuries, um, volatility and inverse volatility ETFs, and basically anything uh, that seeks to provide the inverse performance of stock ind- indexes, bonds, or volatility ETF. So basically the exact opposite of FOMO, right? Very interesting. Again, this is just a filing. This does not exist yet. But a very interesting um, filing at that. That's basically it, guys. Uh, as as far as the you know, I I again, I recommend these are like 
Th- these are really good things to skim if you if you want to learn more about a fund. And again, I found it in Benzinger Pro literally by searching the word FOMO. That's all I did. Um, and this is this is good like evening reading material as, as nerdy as that sounds if you want to just educate yourself about ETFs and how these things work and how like they're legally talked about in in filings you don't have to be an expert in this stuff but you know something to know again a lot of this is very boilerplate it's going to be the same every time but hey something good to look at First thing I did when I when someone tweeted me tweeted at me was I went to look at this filing, right? So all this information about the the, the management, the advisor of the fund, and uh, how they calculate NAV and the experience of everyone that managing the fund and the firm and and all that's in there. Okay, so uh, let's see. What are my thoughts on the Buzz ETF, Nicholas? Did you watch our show last week? Last what day was it? Wednesday, I had Jamie Wise on from Buzz Indexes. Go to, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, this video is part of the playlist, ETF show playlist. Go back to Wednesday's show and we talk with Jamie. My my opinion on the ETF is it if you if if you believe that um, the Reddit fueled um, activity is not a flash in the pan then it could be a good play. At the very least, it's, gonna, it's an indicator, right? It's an indicator of, um, of of maybe where the market could be going because it's what people are talking about. If you believe that the retail trader will move markets like they've been moving markets for the past month. Uh, but I highly recommend talking, uh, watching that interview with Jamie. Jamie is not the, the guy behind the ETF. He's the guy behind the index that the ETF tracks, right? There's a difference there. Um, okay. It is 227 here. We're going to have Frank Holmes, I believe, on in a couple of minutes. If not, then <laughs> don't know what we're going to do. Um, <laughs> let's do some uh, some questions from the chat. Do you only like ARKK? No, Daniel, I actually own here. Let, let me let me pull up my, my list. Uh, I These are the funds that I own. I don't own ARKK. I own ARKW. Okay, right there at the top. RKW. That's the one that I own. I own that. Uh, I bought that uh, right when uh, shit kind of hit the fan last year. After talking and thinking about it for like six, seven months, eight months. Um, and I bought that because, A, obviously you have to want, if you're going to buy an ARK fund, it means you want some growth tech. But I specifically did, specifically did not want biotech in my ARK fund because I already owned the IBB at that point. I just I didn't want more biotech, so um, that was pretty much. It. And I wanted like, but I still still wanted more like broad based tech exposure. And the ARKF is just fintech, ARKG is just genomics. Um, I wanted like broad tech stuff, and I didn't want any biotech, so that kind of left me with one choice, which was ARKW. Um, these are the funds that I own. No changes. I talked about wanting to buy a infrastructure play. Haven't done that yet. I will tell you when I do. But you can see here, super tech heavy, right? Obviously, a lot of tech. Um, and if you have not watched the previous show, these bottom two make up about two thirds of my entire portfolio. V O O V E U. Again, I'm not a, um, I'm not one of these like YOLO traders. I'm I'm pretty diversified in that way. So I talk about you know ARKW gets a lot of the attention. You know, cyber ESPO, but but they make up small portions, small slices of my portfolio. <laughs> Warren Lobb, man, I don't know if that's a compliment or an insult. <laughs> Warren Lobb says, uh, "Great work. It's not as exciting sometimes, but just as important." Thank you, Warren. <laughs> not not exciting, but important. That's going on my gravestone. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Let's uh let's bring on my guest here. <laughs> uh, the ticker for the opposite of the FOMO ETF, actually, I don't know the fat tail risk ETF. I don't, I don't. Uh, let me get back to you on that, uh, Chintan. I don't know. All right, let's get my guest on here, Frank Holmes, as I mentioned, the COO and CIO of U.S. Global Investors. He's had a 
Very interesting year with, with his two ETFs, Jets and Go Gold. We'll bring him on now. Frank, how are we doing today? Outstanding, Spencer. Outstanding? Is that what you said? Outstanding. Outstanding. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions, not just from viewers, but from people in my own life who seem to think I have the answers when it comes to the airlines. Everybody wants to buy the airlines for some reason, and they want to ask me about it. I don't really know why. Um, you're, the, you're the guy to talk to is basically what, what I tell them, right? You've got the Jet TTF. Um, a lot of people have uh, been uh, talking about these, 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 these stocks uh, in this basket. Uh, first, for, if we can just back up for a second, it was it was about a year ago where um, things got a little wild. Can you just kind of walk people through what what went down last year on, on the Jets front? What was going down around this time last year? So, Spencer, what happened? It went from the beginning of 2020 of 100 million dollars down to 35 million dollars with the crisis almost a year ago um, was the bottom, and all of a sudden we started seeing millennials coming in. It was told by minerals buying and buying and buying and that attracted bigger fish the groupers came in and then the dolphins came in and then the sharks came in and then it grew that now there's whale investing in jets and it's gone from 35 million to 4 billion in assets it's gone from trading 35,000 a day to 3.5 million and what's interesting about it to me is that the, the a lot of these young investors are first came in uh, they, they kept buying and buying and, and it, it exploded after Buffett said he was getting out at mm. the uh, end of May, beginning of June. And that was the first big surge. Historically, after any global financial crisis, 9-11, 2008-9, whatever, is, when it's global, the airlines take it on the, the chin, 70 to 75 percent drops. And a year later, they're up 80 to 120 percent. So we can go back and look at when they had SARS in Asia in 2003. Same thing. Big drop a year later, back up. So the, a lot of people came in to speculate on that term. This is different. Business travel is not coming back the way it used to. Uh, it's going to take more time. But tourism is on a tear. People can't wait to get out of the cold north. Northerners can't. And so the airlines have adapted and flying from smaller cities right to Florida and different North Carolina, South Carolina, Texas. Uh, in fact, Southwest Airlines has a nonstop from Phoenix to Cabo St. Lucas uh, in Mexico. So you're seeing that tourism and the TSA started a year ago reporting how many people they cleared every day. What's interesting, it used to be 2.7 million people a day. 2 million mm. domestic people in America, 700,000 from Asia, Latin America, and Europe. The 2 million Americans, it, it contracted to less than 90,000 a day. Jeez. And it's climbed now. And this past week is a 52-week high. So that's good news. And it's gone through 1.3 million. So we are seeing that this report that comes up by the TSA every day that's public now, as yep. it moves, jets moves with the 50-day moving average. To, to what extent do you think is the rally in in jets and then uh, by extension the airline stocks that it holds to what extent is that people just wanting to buy the dip or looking past the pandemic or saying what you just said that uh, in the short term is going to be a huge boon in travel I mean to what do you think can you ascribe this rally to? It's a complete ecosystem. Uh, okay. James Reckie wrote a book years ago on the wisdom of crowds. Mm -hmm. and, and when you have a complete ecosystem, like I mentioned in the beginning, there's minnows, there's tunas, there's dolphins, there's groupers, there's sharks, there's sailfish, there's whales. Uh, you have this, once you have that complete ecosystem, what ha is it really took off with the millennials because the, the operative word is called price discovery. They started buying early and that liquidity attracted more fish and more fish. So all of a sudden uh, I found for people on YouTube in particular or podcasts that many of these millennials use while they're on their peloton working out. 
and and there's so many of these characters and influencers that are in pod, on like the particular YouTube. Sam yeah. Chu, I never heard of Sam Chu. He has 2.5 million followers, and he'll tell you everything about every airline and every what's the best deals and where to go, etc. So there's so much new information flow that's not coming from the big wirehouses. You can't get it, and it's really yeah. not coming from the Schwabs. It's coming from venues like yourself. You're you're the educator yeah. now. You're the influencer. To to what extent do you think you've benefited from the fact that there really isn't another broad based way to buy the airlines? You could buy them all if you wanted to. You could buy jets, and that's pretty much those are your options. Jets is the only pure play, uh, and and what's interesting is that uh, in previous cycles, uh, from bottom to tr from trough to peak, uh, is that you get three big ten percent or more corrections, and we've had two, so you could get another one, and uh, usually that's what makes it the zigzag formation to go back to the economies turned around. But I remain pretty bullish because I think that um, Europe will open up in the summer and so will Canada and uh, Asia. So we'll get that second wave of travel. Um, the other important part is PMIs, Purchasing Manufacturers Index, is a very important part of looking for job demand and commodity demand. And we know this so well from our commodity-based funds. And it's strong. And when China and America are leading, are leading the world, it pulls the rest of the world up. And now we're seeing the rest of the world above 50. The, all this incredible $1.9 trillion going back into the economy. This just means that we're going to be in a robust economy for the next 12 months to two years, unless it gets taxed away by dumb government policies. Uh, Tiago in the chat, Jeff doesn't hold save, does it? Yes, it does. It, it, it does hold save. Actually, can you speak to that, Frank, a little bit? Because... I was surprised when I was looking at Jets last year. You know, you 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 see airlines, and the first thing you think of is all the major U.S. airliners. But Jets is is pretty globally diversified, right? I, if I can pull up a chart here, yeah. it's it's like twenty it's twenty percent outside of North America. You've got some and, uh, some Asia, you got some Europe. It's pretty globally diversified. I mean, for an airline ETF, you wouldn't your first everyone's first thought is oh Delta, American, um, United spirit whatever it's very quant driven uh and they call it a smart beta 2.0 uh and the reason for that is is how it recalibrates every quarter so 40 percent is doing mean reversion 60 percent is doing best of breed who has the best revenue growth or relative cash flow growth uh highest returns on assets and capital and and so there's lots of transition there and when we go global those names are capped at 1%. So that stops down on currency volatility is what we found based on our regressional studies. So it's bogey was to beat the New York Stock Exchange Global Airlines Index. And even after fees, it's done that. I'm so happy that the back testing worked. No, no guarantees of back testing will work, but they yeah. did work when we launched it. And we did the same thing when we launched our GoAU Gold ETF. It's very quant driven. Yeah, and, and we'll get to that in a second. I'm curious if you've ob observed um, any any difference in performance and, uh, with regards to like the the large cap U.S. airliners and like the the small mid caps, right? Because like if you want to group them together, there's like that group of of Southwest, United, American, and then you get like the smaller names like like Alaska, uh, Spirit, uh, Hawaiian. Right, these like smaller air, regional airliners. I'm curious if you observe a difference in performance. So, so, at the beginning of the cycle, there was more pressure shorting Hawaiian Airlines or anyone that had big debt. Save was another one. Yeah, uh, you could see that. So, we have hedge funds that would go long jets and short various airlines in their portfolio. Sure. And so, what we found is that this shift in how the economy is coming out of COVID, which is so unique is tourism is driving it. So all of a sudden you get Hawaiian Airlines jumps 50% in a day because of massive short covering. And the same thing happens with SAVE. So anyone to short the tourist airlines uh, better strap on their seatbelt twice. So 
uh, just to put a bow on this conversation before we go on to uh, some other topics here, what the catalyst, as you see it, the catalyst for airlines for right now is tourism. And even though global business travel is not really going to go back to the way it was. Correct. It's going to be tourism and, uh, and it will lead the way. And then we will see business travel come back. Uh, we got some data this morning. I just remembered from some of the airliners. I guess it was some of it was better than expected for February. Some uh, some low data. I don't know if, how often you're tracking that. And, if you're paying attention to that, did you have a reaction to, to we, the we, data we that are, was out this morning? Some are talking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of the data is suggesting earlier cash flow positive than expected a month ago, mm -hmm. um, which is a positive sign. Uh, and I think it shows up because I mentioned earlier that the TSA reports every day. It's a beautiful piece of data. It's free. Uh, and you can see the trend is hot up. And the trend is your friend when it comes to airlines. And, um, and we have uh, Kevin O'Leary uh, on, on CNBC saying he's shorting these things. Well, since he's been shorting them, they're up 12%. So um, we'll see. Somebody asked earlier in our show uh, about Boeing, and I said, oh, I'll ask Frank, because Jets holds Boeing. But I don't think Jets holds Boeing, does it? It has owned Boeing, uh, okay. and it's a trade-off between Boeing and uh, and Europe. Uh, right. So you Airbus. have Airbus. Yeah. Okay, but it doesn't hold it now. No. Okay. All right. There's your answer to whoever asked that in the chat. All right, let's talk about enough of the Jets. Let's go to gold here. You've got another ETF, GOAU, the Go Gold ETF. And I guess it's more of a, it's not just gold. It's like a, it's a, it's a metals, it's a miners ETF, right? It is, and, it's, and it's, it's the only one that's focused on the royalty companies, which are far outperformed. Like Franco Nevada has outperformed Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway for one year, five years, and 10 years. Uh, and it's the most beautiful streaming business, a high gross margins. You're talking about 80 to 90 percent gross margins. It's a beautiful business. They they basically buy a royalty. They give money to a company to build their mine and they get a royalty on all that production. And any future growth is all free to them. So it's 30 percent of the three big royalty companies that recalibrates once a quarter, like Jets with the four major airlines recalibrates. Thereafter, GoAU is focused on those companies which have the strongest revenue per share. The last quarter of four quarters, cash flow last quarter of four quarters and highest uh, free cash flow. These are the important stocks that they show up or they're the cheapest on a cash flow to EBIT of value. And it's bogey was to beat the GDXJ which uh, the back testing said it would outperform it on a rolling 12 month period for a decade, uh, over 90% of the time. And since we launched it, it's what it's done. I think uh, GDX is down 15% uh, and we're down uh, eight. Um, so even down cycles and up cycles, it's done exactly what it said it should do. Um, and, but I think what's interesting is last week we did a presentation on ETFs and it was with high blockchain technology, which I'm the chairman, and I couldn't launch a Bitcoin uh, ETF because it wouldn't allow it to happen for many reasons. But the first crypto mining company uh, in the world was Hive. And 1,600 people came on. It was uh, amazing the interest or the crypto uh, shocked me. But uh, I think that, you know, is gold. Can you have gold along with crypto? I believe they're inclusive. I believe that um, the crypto world is about 2% of our portfolio. But gold should always be 10% and high quality gold stocks. So now what we're seeing since September is rising 10 year government bond yields. Gold always sells off. It did it the year before, it's doing it again and it creates a trough. And I think we see gold in a year from now much higher. But now I'm distracted on, on the Bitcoin ETF thing. Are, are you in that rat race to try to get, to, to get that thing through the pipes? Through the, no, through the SEC no, pipes? no, I'm, I'm high blockchain. It's, it's gone okay. from a $30 million valuation we created to uh, 2 billion. We just got our first Bitcoin ETF in North America a couple weeks ago. It's only a matter of time before it comes to, to the U S okay. Uh, we'll go back to hive in a second, but, but staying with gold here, this is interesting because, uh, well, I guess you're, you're simultaneously bullish crypto and 
bullish gold, precious metals, you don't see too many of those people, I feel like. That's kind of a walking contradiction. No, it's not because because, because crypto is a limited supply. Bitcoin is very well defined. Now, Bitcoin had a big surge this past year. Why? They have the supply. The world produces about 100 million ounces of gold a year. What would happen if it went to 50 million? Gold would be at 10,000. I mean, yeah. this is pretty simple uh, to grasp uh, that if you restrict the supply and there's a growing audience that's saying, I want to diversify against all this money printing. I mean, we're talking about, what, uh, $4 trillion now, and then we add Europe. If you look at the G20 countries in the past 20 years, which shocks a lot of people, is that they've been growing each year in MMT, modern monetary theory, which is basically money printing and getting it out to various parts of the economy in different ways. Or they print money and they buy tax-free bond ETFs, the Federal Reserve does to get uh, yields down for munis. Uh, you're seeing Japan owns 15% of their own stock market through ETFs. The Swiss own directly stocks by printing this negative rates of return of money, and they buy Apple and get a positive rate of return. So it this MMT theory is really interesting to me because it's grown, but, and gold for the past 20 years has been positive 80% of the time. And gold has outperformed the S&P 500 by 250%. So not owning some gold in a portfolio is just not wise, and especially in the backdrop of all this money printing. Now we're going to see the biggest transfer of wealth from baby boomers to millennials, and millennials grew up in a crypto world. So we're going to see the, the adoption and the creation of the interest in crypto. Uh, gold is, to me, is, is the, what, the fourth most liquid asset class in the world, been around for 5,000 years. And once you make it, you don't need electricity. You need electricity to make Bitcoin work. So there's strengths and weaknesses, and you really can't wear your Bitcoin. But in India, women wear six times the amount of gold that's in Fort Knox. That's called the great love trade. So I don't think gold's going away. And I believe that both are part of a good diversified portfolio. Yeah, and the, the case against NMT was always, oh, what about inflation? Well, I guess we're about to find that out, right? Like we're finding it out in real time. <laughs> inflation, so. inflation is way understated if you follow some economists. If you use the algorithm that defines right. what CPI is in 1980 algorithm, when gold hit 850, silver hit $50 an ounce, gold hit yep. $80 a barrel. If you use that algorithm, inflation is at 9% today. I, uh, I agree I with you that the CPI is probably not an accurate measure. Put it it's, that called, way. it's called fake index. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, yeah, you could use that or you could just go with your eyeballs, right? I mean, there's inflation pretty much everywhere. It um, is. And, and uh, maybe mortgages are cheap. That's the only thing where people get a reprieve. Yeah. Uh, but food prices are all double digit. I'm um, looking, I'm doing construction in the back of my house, and, and they're telling me lumber prices are up 100%. Uh, due to COVID. Yeah. Uh, steel prices are yeah. up 70%. I think the great deal is buy your cars. Your, you know, you, cars in 18 months are going to be very expensive because those new steel prices are going to have to get embedded into them. Uh, and, and I think you're going to see huge pressure on the other Interesting, upside. interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically everything except for consumer electronics uh, are <laughs> is, is going up. Um, someone in chat, who was it? Uh, Boris asked if sand is in the GOAU. Yes, it is. It is one of the top holdings, I believe. S-A-N-D. Sandstorm. Yeah. It looks like it's so one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And it's a very, um, it's like a, a biotech uh, stock, you know, it's much more volatile. It's a wealthy company. It takes on bigger risks than some of the other, the bigger major ones, but it's a great CEO and it's done a phenomenal job doing that company. All right, last thing here, uh, you already mentioned it. Uh, I'll, I'll bring up the chart though. Hive blockchain um, trades on the OTC QB, I believe. And it's, it's just, it, it's a mining play, right? Crypto mining? Crypto mining play. It's the only one that mines Ethereum and Bitcoin. Okay. It, it mines both. 
And it's the most profitable so far of all these companies that are out there, the Marathon, the Riot, um, their market caps are bigger, but they are not close to the profitability that we've been able to demonstrate. Our recent results came out and we've made 28 million for the first nine months this year. Um, so we're excited about the growth. We have a five-fold increase in growth over the next 12 months, and uh, we'll be seeking the uh, 20F registration with the SEC to get listed in the U.S., a full, a my full listing on a major... That that was my question, which is what what is the reason that you're not on 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 an, on an exchange? It's well, it's on exchange in Canada, and it traded 1.7 billion <laughs> shares there. It traded 500 okay. million on the market in the U.S. It traded 2.3 billion shares last year. Yep. Yeah, I mean, one of the more active names for sure on the OTC markets, no doubt. Number four uh, of all OTC stocks last year. Really, I didn't realize it was. It was. Up. Yeah. I mean, I, I knew that Grayscale was up there, and I knew Roche was up there, and I realized Hive is up there. Wow, I was okay. more liquid than Grayscale. More liquid, in in more terms liquid. of in terms of the spread. Sure okay. All right, Frank Holmes is the CEO and CIO of U.S. Global Investors, also uh, Hive Blockchain. He's everywhere. He's he's in the gold market. He's in the crypto market. He's in the airline market. Uh, Frank, uh, it was last minute today, so thank you so much for coming on and saving me. And uh, we'll have to have you back later in the year and see how things are going for you. Thank you, Spencer, and great questions. All right, All right thank you. Uh, okay, 252. Let's get that banner off the screen. Thanks again to Frank Holmes. I appreciate his time. It was 20 minutes of his day right there. And let's do some questions from the chat. If you have any questions, now is the time. If not, we can just hang out. All right, talk about whatever for the next few minutes. Um, but it pretty much is the extent of, oh, okay, I, I'd have written this down. TGIF, right? That was from the top of the show. SoFi Weekly Income ETF. I don't know anything about that. Let's look it up. Great ticker. Maybe I should do like a, like a best ticker show, right? Just for ETFs. This would be on the list, no doubt. That's a great freaking ticker. TGIF. What is the comp? What is the what does the fund do? It doesn't even tell me. I have to go to the the page. All right. Well, what does it hold? Okay. Fantastic. Bonds, corporate bonds, corporate bonds. What else we got? Yeah, I don't know anything about this ETF, so I'm learning it, learning as I uh, as I go for the first time. Um, this is not complete. Again. Not complete information. That'll happen. Let's look at a chart. Oh, so oh, that's that's probably why I hadn't heard of it. It's really relatively new. Probably pretty small too, right? Where's the AUM? Oh, extremely small. Okay, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means it really it hasn't caught on yet. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of a lot of eyeballs on it. That's okay. I never even heard of Torso Investments. So I don't know much about this. I'm so whoever asked. I'm sorry. I, I don't know. I don't know much about it. Um, looks like it's corporate bond, corporate bonds. Which okay, you know. If again, if you want the best thing about ETFs, right, is that. If you want to, if you have an idea, there's usually like 10 or 20 different ways to express that point of view via an ETF. Um, this is newer, smaller. Um, let's look at a chart. I just had that up. So so when I say at the top that ETFs are, are liquid, they're usually liquid. I don't know how liquid this is. I don't have the, the bit in the ask up right now, but um, I'll say there's not a ton of volume. So be mindful of that. But yeah, I don't have any opinions about TJ. The chart looks great. I'll say that. The chart looks great for a, for a corporate bond ETF. Okay, what else we got? Do, 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 do. Scrolling up, scrolling up.
AKBA is not not a ETF, so I don't want to look at that. Is it safer to do options on ETFs? Safer is a loaded word, Chintan. Loaded word. Is it safer? I guess this is the part where I tell you that I'm not a financial advisor, right? And all the information on this show is meant to be used as informational purposes, not for investing or trading advice. Is it safer? I don't. I don't know. I, I guess it would depend on your on, on your time horizon, right? Uh, on your risk tolerance. Um, no, not necessarily. No, options are still options, right? You you're betting on price and time. It really just comes down to how how volatile is the underlying asset, right? Is the underlying asset a stock? Is an ETF? It doesn't matter as long as if if they have the same volatility, what difference does it make? So I don't I don't necessarily know if they're safer. Um, let's talk SOS. No, let's not. <laughs> we can talk SOS. Uh, Mitch is going to start the at the close stream, I think, in a few minutes. So you can talk SOS with Mitch. Um, is Jets uh, good or just okay? <laughs> I love that question. Is it good or is it just okay? <laughs> Look, if you want to own the airlines, there are very few ways to do it. Straight up, that that that's a fact, right? That's pro- that's that's what I was getting at with my question to Frank. Um, I think Jets has benefited a lot from the fact that it, it is the only pure airlines play out there. If you if if you are uh, if you want to make a play in the airlines and you're like me and you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You would just buy the Jets and call it a day. And I'm sure a lot of people did that. I'm sure a lot of people bought Jets mostly to buy the dip, is, is what I think. Just to buy the dip. It got crushed last year. And it's come almost all the way back. And also, something that Frank said, uh, Frank said that Jets is at uh, 52 week high. Well, uh, okay, just, just ignore all 52 week highs for the next like three months, okay? Because everything. Is going to be at a 52 week high because this time last year, everything was getting destroyed. Okay. So just like, every time you see a 52 week high, just ignore it because it's really, you're really relevant for, uh, for the next, next couple months. Uh, okay. Let's see what else from the chat. DFEN. That's a good one. This is, uh, this is directions. There aren't too many that I know of. I don't know of any other uh, leverage plays on, on this sector. If you want to make make a short term call on on Boeing or that 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 industrial defense space, right? DFEN is, I think, the only the only way to do it. So, um, again, funds like this and Jets, where there's not a lot of competition. Let me get that off the screen. Uh, where there's not a lot of competition, definitely increases the chance of the fund success. Um, that's a good point from blockchain. Brian, very good point. Options like spy options, super liquid, right? Options on the QQQ, super liquid. That's a great point on the options ETF question that I neglected to bring up. So they're safer in that sense. It's a very good point. The option market for those, for those funds are super thick. Can we look at buzz? Uh, Okay. Had Jimmy on the show last week. Very, no history to go off of here. It's like a week old, right? I mean, that's not bad. I mean, again, we have like a week of data. So what did it open at? 24? It's, oh, it's up a dollar in what? A week and a half? Okay. Cool. Um, well, let's do one more here. NRGU. Oh man. Okay, I- I'm gonna have the guys from that from this firm from Microsectors on the show. I don't know when, but I- I'm gonna get them on the show. Um, these are this is a leveraged ETN. Okay, so like even more risky than a leveraged ETF because it's not it doesn't actually invest in stocks, right? It invests in like swaps and 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 it's base. It's an ETN. It's an exchange traded note. Okay. So not only is this subject to the general market risk of leverage, it's subject to the credit risk of the bank 
that the notes are with. In this case, the bank is the Bank of Montreal. Uh, so that's like another risk factor. Just be aware of that. This is not an ETF. It is an ETN. It is a different product altogether. Most people, I would imagine, who use this are uh, advanced traders and understand the risks they're taking. I don't know how large the retail audience is on a uh, security like 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 NRGU, right? So, again, good way to play oil, but it, like in the short term, overnight, whatever. But please, ETNs. It, it's 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 a leverage ETN. It's got it's got more risks. Just know what you're doing. Know know what you're getting into before um before you're buying one of these things. Um, and last one here, Daniel. Uh. I like ARKQ. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I like all the the uh, the ARK, ARK ETFs to an extent, but you know, when you're when you're thinking about what you want to buy, you got to think about what works for you, okay? And I bought the ARKW rather than the ARKQ. Their performance going back to when I bought it. So it's worked out for me a little bit. That's that's not you know an insane outperformance, but over the long term, if this holds up, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. It just comes down to what what do you want to own? What do you want to own? You want to own the exposures to the to the KW or the KQ? I mean, they're all, they're all basically the same thing. It's not that big a difference. You have them all. Well, Daniel, I hope for your sake that you have a long time horizon and a high risk tolerance because as we've seen in the past few weeks, these things can move down in a hurry. I own one of these things and I was sweating the other week. I hope you've got some like dividend stocks or ETFs or something, some kind of value play in there as well to offset super high growth. Or if you don't, then you have a high risk tolerance and you don't sweat the daily moves, and that's fine too. But if you're uh, if the volatility is keeping you up at night, it means you got too, you got too much risk. Man, you, you guys are you guys are all in, Kathy. I, I hope it works out for you. If it works out for you, it will, it'll work out for me too. Um, I don't have the risk tolerance to go all in on any one manager. It's really really hard to do what she's doing for. <laughs> one year is hard. Two years is harder. There are very few who have done it. And growth has cycles. So I hope it works out for you. You know, I'm on Kathy. I own the one. You own all of them. That is certainly a more bullish take on growth than, than I have. But okay, it is 303. Mitch is live. I'm going to join Mitch in about, I don't know, a few minutes. And we'll get Joel on at 3.30. I want to thank everyone for hanging out. Thanks to Frank Holmes. Please, please, please hit that like button. Don't just hit it. Smash the like button. Thank you very much. I'll have more guests. Well, we have a guest on our show on Wednesday. I leave from Van Eck. A guest on our show from on Friday uh, who's got commodity ETFs. And I'll have a guest on our show for next Monday. Um, I got all these guests planned out. So that's going to be a wrap for me. I'm going to hop off. I'll see you over in the other stream. And again, hit the like button. Hit the like. You know you want to. Just, just, just do it. Just, just do it. Just, just hit the like.